This podcast is brought to you by Aetna. Learn how Aetna is working to build a healthier world by visiting aetnastory.com. Dora, have you given any thought as to how you want to bring in 2020? I can't believe it's so close that the year is coming to an end and we're coming into a new year. Yes, we're hosting in partnership with the Gasparilla Inn a wellness experience on January 27th in Boca Grande, Florida. What's going to happen down there? We're going to be doing cooking demonstrations. We're going to be walking on the beach. We're going to be doing yoga every morning. We're going to be learning from world-class teachers on how to take better care of ourselves. I mean, it's just going to be amazing. So go to our website, bbrconsulting.us, to learn more and to sign up. And we look forward to seeing you on January 27th. Can't wait to see you all there. People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. We are here with David Faraday. What a treat for us today. And David, we want to thank you for being on our podcast. We're so delighted to have you join us. You're so admired by so many people. And one of them is my brother, President Bush 43, who considers you a friend and is especially grateful for what you do for our veterans. And he first and foremost wanted me to say hello from him. Well, that's very kind. Thank you. I'm delighted to be on. So we want to start a little bit at the beginning. You grew up in Bangor County down Ireland, and you actually grew up singing in a church. And at one point, I think you wanted to be an opera singer. I did, but, uh, you know, I figured out, unfortunately, just in time, that the last thing the world needed was another mediocre Irish tenor clutching the bar and butchering Danny Boy. (laughs) Is that when you turned to golf, or how did that happen? Well, it was really the only other thing that I could do, and I wasn't particularly good at that at the time either. I had learning difficulties, I think is the uh, PC way of putting it these days. I was a hopelessly uh, attention deficit child, and the only things that I I could do were uh, the things that interested me, and those were English and music. I was very fortunate to have great teachers in those two subjects. I couldn't pass an exam uh, other than those two. So really, you know, the the only other thing I could think of to do was to play golf for a living. And when when I turned professional, I I had a five handicap, which is not very good. You know, so it was kind of a leap of faith for my parents even to allow me to do it. Did you come from a family of golfers? Well, my my father played and and I grew up about 200 yards from the 10th tee at Banker Golf Club. Mm. My father wasn't a good player. By any stretch of the imagination, he was an ordinary club golfer who liked to play at the weekends with his friends. And uh, I really got interested in the game by caddying for him and for other members. And then that's where you sort of found that maybe you'd be pretty good at this. Well, uh, you know, it it was against the odds that I became good. (laughs) I actually stood up in a geography class. I just turned 17. They were teaching me about the average rainfall in western Samoa. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, I, I figured that that really wasn't going to be uh, information that would be useful to me in later life. So I quit school right there and then. I uh, became a professional golfer. Wow. So you went on the European tour, but one of the things that I read, and Trisha and I are both mothers of four mm-hmm. children each, mm-hmm. that you came home because you missed your mom. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I was <laughs> nice. yeah, 17. <laughs> I got a job as an assistant professional across the water in England. I really uh, was very unhappy, very sad about having to leave my mom. I think 17 back then was a lot younger than 17 is today. So I came back and and got an assistant pro's job uh, closer to home. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have two sisters, one elder, one younger. Hmm. Do they play golf? My elder sister plays a little bit now. She didn't then. My dad was really the only one that played in the family. And your ADD, did that just go, I guess back then it wasn't something that was diagnosed, right? You just knew. No, they called it stupid back then. I only realized what it was when I had my own sons tested here in America because they both had similar difficulties. Mm -hmm. And so from there, you came back to England and did that stint. Then what happened? I got on the European tour, as, as you said, and I'd improved. 
pretty rapidly as a player. I won the Irish PGA Championship a couple of times and, and qualified for the European Tour. And I played in an era along with players like Ballesteros and Langer and Woosnam and Faldo and that sort of genre, if you like, where these were players that were coming across the United States and winning the Masters and making the Ryder Cup relevant again. I was never going to be one of those really, really top echelon players. You know, they say there's comfort in mediocrity. Um, <laughs> and although you can't be mediocre and play the game for 20 years, and make a living, but I was never going to be, you know, right at that very top level. You just knew that. Is that what the case was, or did somehow you prevent yourself from being that? I prevented myself. And looking back on it, you know, having played for so many years, you know, successful people, they want to be in a place where they know they're going to be uncomfortable. I interview people now all the time, politicians and businessmen and athletes and, you know, entertainers. And that's the one thing that they have in common at one stage in their lives that they've taken that step into a place where they knew they were going to be uncomfortable and they wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. Unsuccessful people just don't do the things that, that successful people do, especially here in the United States where there's so much opportunity. Looking back at my playing career, I didn't want that responsibility that came with being a great it was only really when I got into television that I realized that this is where I want you know, to be. I want to be uncomfortable in this place, uh, not so much uh, as a player. How did you find your way to television? To be perfectly honest with you, I was the right drunk in the right bar at the, at the right <laughs> time. I'd qualified for uh, the World Series of Golf at Firestone in Akron, Ohio. I was in the middle of a horrifying divorce at the time, and I really didn't want to be in the United States. I was kind of dragged here, kicking and screaming. And in retrospect, you know, it was the single greatest thing that ever happened to me. Mm. It's funny, you know, how these things happen for a reason. And for me, just standing in the bar at the Hilton in Fairlawn, Ohio, I was approached by two gentlemen who said they were from CBS. And I immediately thought, you know, this is 60 minutes. They're going to do a fearless expose on alcoholism and golf or drugs in sport or something like that. But as it turned out, they were looking for a replacement for a gentleman called Ben Wright, who was the English man that sat behind the 15th green at the Masters for, uh, I don't know, probably 20 years. Had such a great rapport with other announcers like Gary McCord and Jim Nance. He had been fired. They were looking for someone that could take his place, maybe someone with a foreign accent, because <laughs> apparently in, in golf, he, that makes us uh, more knowledgeable. Right. <laughs> yeah. Kind of true. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I was just lucky enough to be in that place at that time. And I had a relationship with the players on both sides of the Atlantic, perhaps more importantly, the caddies on both sides of the Atlantic, mm. because that's where a lot of the information comes from. Interesting stuff, the, the men who carry the bags. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you remember when the drinking started? Uh, yes, I do. I was probably... 13 or 14 years old, you know, I mean, there's a certain amount of truth to the, uh, you know, the rumor that the Irish are good at this. And uh, <laughs> like anything else, you know, you become good because of practice. I started drinking cider and, you know, with my friends at the beach, uh, Ballyhome Beach in Bangor in the, uh, what we used to call the shelters. Uh, you know, it rains a lot there, you know, so there were like public benches, you know, undercover, things like that. And it was just part of the culture. Kids started to drink pretty early there. I got good at it really quickly. My father was, uh, you know, he was an alcoholic. You know, I, I would warn my children, and I think it's very important for any uh, addict or alcoholic to make their children aware that they're predisposed to this. They're more likely to fall into that same way of life. When I look back at my family's history, whenever I was diagnosed with a mental illness, I discovered that it was pretty rife in my family. My grandfather, my uncles, you know, my father, you know, there's a history of depression and addiction right there. It's therapeutic to me, the feeling that, you know, if I say something about it or if I admit to these problems, that it might help someone else. Uh, and that's helpful to me. It's comforting to me to be able to do that. It's a gift. It is yes, a gift. It is. So you talk about being a functional alcoholic. What does that mean? Because Trish and I read that you at one point were drinking two and a half bottles of whiskey and taking 40 Vicodin in a day. How did you function and what does that mean? Well, it's just a tremendous tolerance for, for poison. That's the concise way to put it. I could drink 
you know, a couple of bottles of whiskey, and it was only 20 Vicodin. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> David, you've shared that it often took you a bottle of whiskey to get to where other people are on a normal baseline. Can you talk about that? I felt like I, I needed to drink a, a bottle of whiskey in order to get to a place where most people started. You know, looking back at it, I was killing pain. That's all. The old Pink Floyd song, you know, comfortably numb. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's what I wanted to be. Do you mean the mental pain, not physical pain or both? It was both. There is a physical pain that comes with depression, and I didn't realize it. Of course, I didn't realize that I was depressed for the longest time. But there's a general sort of body ache that, that comes with that that I thought everybody had. I thought it was just a normal part of life. Yeah, and it was only when I was diagnosed as bipolar that I became aware of that. And, you know, the other thing that's remarkable about you is your friends. You're just loyal to your friends, and your friends are loyal to you. And the story about Tom Watson, can you share that with our listeners? Yeah, I've been incredibly lucky uh, with friends. They've stuck by me, uh, you know, through all of this, particularly my wife, 23 years. She's, you know, she's tried to fix me. I'm still broken, but I'm a whole lot better than I was because of her. But Tom has been like a big brother to me ever since I did a made-for-TV thing in Canada for Canadian television. It was Jack Nicklaus versus Tom Watson. I was at the depths of depression and drinking very heavily and taking all kinds of painkillers and other drugs, just anywhere to get out of the place that I, I felt I was. I was just an incredibly dark, cold, damp hole, and there was one warm, dry hand that reached down for me, and it was Tom Watson's. I'd interviewed Jack in the clubhouse, and he was sitting there with Barbara, and I went to interview with Tom, and uh, the red light went on on the camera, and uh, I asked him the first question, and Tom just looked kind of strangely at me, and he put his hand over the lens and looked at me and said, you're not well, are you? And I was kind of taken aback. I said, no, I'm not. I said, how do you know? He said, I can see it in your eyes. I said, well, what do you see? And he said, I see my reflection. Mm. And uh, I didn't know uh, at the time, very few people did, that Tom uh, had a problem with alcohol as well. And he'd been sober for a little while. And he said to me, you you need to come with me when we're done here. We were in Prince Edward Island in the Maritimes. And I said, to where? He said, to Kansas City. So at this stage, I'm backpedaling. I said, hey, you know, we need two float planes and a canoe to get to Toronto from here. How are we going to get to Kansas City? And then a voice from behind me said, you need to go with him. You look like crap. uh, I'm I'm being heckled by Jack Nicholas and asked to accompany Tom Watson. So Jack flew us there on his G5 the following day after the match was over. I went to Tom's meeting. That was the start of sobriety for me. I had almost 10 years of sobriety, and then I had a bit of a bump in the road when my son died. But I've just gone past a year again, you know, the second time, and, uh, you know, I, I feel great. I've heard you talk about your head being tremendously busy. Is that something you still deal with, and how do you cope with it? I really struggle with that. Uh, I have difficulty thinking about one thing at a time. My mind is always sort of jumping around. I deal with it with chemicals. It's a chemical imbalance. The drug Adderall, which they use to treat attention deficit disorder, might be the the most important one that I take for me because I'm able to focus my attention on one thing. It's odd. I can take an Adderall and actually think about one thing enough that I can actually go to sleep. I have tremendous difficulty sleeping. Uh, I sleep maybe three or four hours. I wake myself up and, you know, then I I can't get back to sleep. So I take little naps during the day. That's how I deal with it. It took me a long time and I went through several psychiatrists before I found Dr. A, I call him. And I went to the Mayo Clinic and had all kinds of tests run, you know, to find out which drugs are metabolized better than others. And it was a really difficult and complex ordeal to find the right mixture of mood stabilizers and antidepressants and attention deficit, just a bunch of them. I take 11 pills at night and and three in the morning. I actually had an incident uh, at the Open Championship earlier this year where my medicine was stolen. And I had no idea how reliant I was on this because about 36 hours, and I was in Northern Ireland at this stage, you know, I had no way of getting replacements. After about 36 hours, I was in a fetal position, just uh, unable to function. 
Fortunately, my wife, she flew to New York and with the little reserve supply that I have, found someone that flew to Northern Ireland with it. That's how urgent it was. I couldn't function at all. David, we're so sorry about your son Shay's death, and we know how difficult that must have been for you and your family. You said that that's when you relapsed again. Yeah, I warned both my sons. I told them to be careful, you know, with alcohol and with drugs because they were predisposed to it because of me. The guilt that comes with as well uh, was the most difficult time in my life, that particular period. I just relapsed and went into that same pattern of trying to kill the pain again, and it lasted about 18 months. Mm. And somehow you've got the medication and and you're digging pretty deep. Because earlier you're saying that Anita, your wife, is trying to fix you and she's done a good job. But is it true that really you have to want to do it? Yes. You know, anyone with addiction problems, there are common denominators there. And the main one is, you know, you have to want to fix yourself. Part of the problem is you know that you can't be fixed permanently. People say, you know, I'm a recovering alcoholic. No, you're not. You're just not drunk. That's that's the way it goes, because as soon as you have a drink, you know, one is too many and 30 isn't enough. That's the, the nature of addiction. You Once you're an addict, that's it. You, you see these frou-frou uh, commercials on television. You know, I used to be an addict and now I'm not. Mm-hmm. That's just a lie. That's mm-hmm. all that is. And it shouldn't be allowed on television. It's fraud. That's the essence of the problem. You know, if you have that addictive personality and you get hooked, you stay hooked. It's as simple as that. You know, and you're not recovering. You're just not drunk. I read that you've said an addict's worst enemy is spare time. And yes. Yeah. So how do you keep from getting too busy or how do you find balance and what do you do with that spare time? You know, you have to find something to fill the time, but you can't you know, allow yourself to become manic with it, which is one of the things I have to deal with. When I originally got sober, you know, meeting with Tom and, you know, becoming a friend there, Mm -hmm. um, I found the bicycle. When I quit drinking, I lost 70 pounds and that was without any exercise. So when I found myself much lighter, I thought, you know, this is going to be easier to get into shape. And I found a racing bicycle. And one day I just rode past my AA meeting and I kept on riding. I live in Dallas. I rode up 75 Central Expressway almost to Oklahoma, <laughs> and uh, yeah, which is about 85 miles. I turned around and realized that all of a sudden it was into the wind, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, ro- I rode about another 10 and had to call my wife to come and get me because you know, I, I cramped up so badly. But that was originally how I dealt with this. I wasn't sleeping. I would get up at three o'clock in the morning and and ride for five or six hours and come back. And that was like taking my hand and brushing all my problems off the table. It was such an amazing feeling for me to have done that, you know, and to feel so physically good. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I, I got run over by a truck and trailer filled with lawn equipment and it crushed me all the way. Uh, on my left side, you know, broke the ribs, punctured my lung and crushed my left arm. Oh. And now I got back on the bicycle after that, after about nine months and immediately got hit again oh. from behind uh, and woke up in a Detroit hospital wearing a turban <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> it, uh, fractured skull. And, you know, so uh, after a, a couple of episodes like that and one more in New York where I went through a windshield. Somebody was trying to tell me something there. Oh, my God. Did You you just have a high tolerance for pain, too, right? I do. I began thinking to myself, you know, alcohol wasn't going to kill me. It was going to find a way to kill me (laughs) if I was going to get run over by a beer truck or something. (laughs) Death by irony. (laughs) Oh, my word. So I, I quit that. And I started a foundation for wounded armed forces, and I was getting uh, the occasional sniper into the foundation that had been wounded. And there was one in particular, a young man called John Wayne Walding, who was a Green Beret, Silver Star Green Beret. He was going to go to college when he came back from Afghanistan, which I didn't think was a very good idea, because a lot of these kids, you know, they're fantastic soldiers, but they're not very good at being civilians. And it takes them a long time to get that transition right, you know, from being a soldier to being a civilian. So I suggested that, you know, he find something badass to do, like (laughs) maybe build rifles, seeing that he was a sniper. So we found a gunsmith here in Dallas, Dick Cook, one of the founder members of the Gunsmiths Association of America. And he taught us both how to do this. Well, we started a little company called Five Toes Custom Gunworks because John only has five toes. He lost his leg in Afghanistan. 
it kind of went from there. And I, now I build rifles in my shop in my garage here, and I give them to our wounded service men and women. And that's how I occupy my time as a machinist. I read you experience sadness every day, and sometimes you're sad all day long. Yet in the next sentence, I read that you're probably the happiest you've been. How do you explain that? That's the nature of bipolar disorder. You get terrific mood swings, which is one of the reasons that the mood stabilizer is such a, an important drug. I find myself dwelling on negative things, on the things that made me sad, you know, like my son's death. I tell people that I have PTSD. I have pre-traumatic stress disorder. I'm pretty sure something bad's going to happen, but I have no idea when. <laughs> <laughs> things like a really horrific divorce, stuff like that comes back and haunts the mentally ill. Those are the things that creep up on me. And I do, I have periods of sadness every day, but uh, I know that they won't last. And uh, as long as I stay on my medication, you know, which I don't like taking, any addict or any mentally ill person will tell you that they don't like taking their medication. It doesn't make them feel the way they want to feel. But when I don't have it and I get tempted every now and then, you know, to stop it, it comes up on me pretty quickly that I need to take it. So the idea is you're learning to live with your mental illness as opposed yes. to suffering from it. That's correct. Yeah, I, I live with it. I've decided that I don't want to be a depressive. You know, I want to depress other people. <laughs> that cheers me up. <laughs> that cheers me up immensely. You know, you talk about because of all your experiences that you've shared with us and with others, that you have this unique perspective of looking at things maybe from the other side of the street. Do you think that that is again, a gift that comes from all of what you've dealt with and what you've become? I, I think so. If you look at any artist or comedian, for example, a comic, you walk a knife edge. You know, they say comedy is tragedy plus timing. Mm. It's pretty true. You know, you can fall either side of that blade very easily. But, you know, a sense of humor is like the last defense of a human soul. And you see it I grew up in an urban warfare environment in Northern Ireland. The people in Northern Ireland are particularly funny. And I think it's because of that, that you have to find something humorous just to keep your chin up, if you like. Now, I grew up in an atmosphere where there was a lot of humor, but it was kind of gallows humor. It was dark. And I didn't realize that my parents were funny, for example, until I was sophisticated enough to understand that there doesn't have to be laughter when people are being funny. My dad was very dry. My mom, even drier. Uh, and I, I'm lucky enough still to have her. You know, she'll be 90 in March um, and uh, still able to uh, come over and visit me here in Dallas. Flies by herself. She still drives. She is one funny wee lady. <laughs> <laughs> and did she shoot one of your guns or did you give her one of your guns or where did we hear that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She has had a hit at a thousand yards. <laughs> At 89 years old. In addition to your golf show, we know that you also do a live show called Faraday Off Tour, wandering around on his own. And we understand that you still get terrified when you go up on stage. Is that true? Yeah, I am. I'm genuinely terrified before I get on stage. I do about between 20 and 25 gigs a year in the smaller theaters around the country. It's been tremendously therapeutic for me to be able to get on stage and have a thousand or 1500 people there and to be able to hold their attention and make them laugh for two hours. It's a healing experience mm. for me almost to be able to do that. But I am genuinely shaking a couple of times. Uh, you know, I've thrown up yeah. on stage because there's always that feeling, you know, that tonight might be the night where you just freeze up. Yeah. Right. That's horrifying. And it's healing for the people who are in the audience, too. You know, they say laughter is the best medicine, which is absolute garbage because medicine <laughs> is the best medicine. <laughs> you know. Is it true that Tiger calls you farty? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. And I've. I have no idea why. Okay. <laughs> Trisha and I really want to meet Anita. I know. The way yeah. you talk about her. And how much you love her. And she's oh, a bright she light you. in your life. And yeah. we love the quote about your genuine kindness, which we've heard a lot about, and how your genuine kindness has given you a few more mulligans in life than most people get. People ask me what my favorite interview was on the Faraday show, the Golf Channel show, mm -hmm. and I always come back to Bill Russell. You know, I've had so many of them o over the last 10 years that it's difficult sometimes to remember. But Bill Russell stands out for me because of one question I asked him. You know, here's the greatest winner in the history of American sports, 11 rings. 
I asked him what advice he would give to any young athlete in any sport that wanted to turn professional. And he thought for a little while and he looked at me and he said, be kind. Mm. I, I thought it was the most beautiful answer, like most beautiful things, you know, really simple. It struck me and it stayed with me. I mean, it's not that I was unkind at the time, but I've made an effort since then to try to be kind to every single person that I meet and try to see the best in them. It's really worked for me. It has, you know, I've made great friends of people that might not have been friends otherwise. And I, I think that's what's missing, not just in America, but around the world today is that kindness. And how do you see kindness and compassion? Um, you know, you could throw empathy in there as well. You know, when I see someone that has a problem or, you know, a perceived problem, I look at my own life and think, well, I've got that one as well. I think you just empathize with people instead of judging them. You know, being non-judgmental is a tremendously important part of kindness. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can be kind, you know, if you're judgmental. We've heard about the story with Rory after he didn't win and you went running over to him. Can you tell us about that? Uh, Rory at the Masters? Yes. You know, I'm so proud of that boy. He's uh, just such a great ambassador for the game and, and for Northern Ireland. He's a mother's dream. He's just such a nice kid. And, you know, to have that talent and to remain as accessible and as nice as he is to absolutely everybody. He touches people and he remains touchable uh, You know, himself. I was sort of devastated because he had the Masters in his grasp, leading by four with nine holes to play. And he just unraveled under the pressure. There were a lot of the pundits said, you know, well, that could affect him for the rest of his career. And, you know, I knew where he was staying. I ran over there in Augusta to find him that night. And he was sitting with two of his school friends that had been over for the tournament, drinking a Coke in the corner. And they'd been throwing a ball out in the backyard. There were a few people around. You know, I said to him, are you all right, son? He said, oh, hi. You know, he said, if that's the worst day I ever had, I'll be all right. I thought that was an amazingly mature thing to say for a 22-year-old kid that had just given away the biggest golf tournament in the world. I think I read that by the end of that meeting, he was on the floor laughing. So, again, <laughs> the use of humor. Yeah, well, I'd like to think that I had a part in it, but I'm, I'm not sure. I think he's huge enough as a character. He has what's so vital, I, I think, for anyone that's going to be really successful. He has a tremendously high opinion of himself without allowing other people to be aware of it. We ask all of our guests which book they think everyone should read. What do you think? That's a good one. <laughs> um, you know, I had an English teacher. His name was Jack Murphy. He died actually shortly after I left school. Uh, he died very early, and it was a great loss. He would read to us out loud rather than have us read the book ourselves. He would read the first few chapters. It was so engrossing. He made books so interesting. He did all the accents. And really, you know, you could hear a pin drop in that classroom when Jack Murphy was reading a book. And what he did was, it was very clever, he would read the first few chapters and then give us the books. And we had become so engrossed in the book that we wanted to read the rest of it to see what happened. I read so much as a child because of Jack Murphy. He taught me how to read. My music teacher, a man called Ian Hunter, he taught me how to listen. You know, I would tell my children, if you can count in your head and think on your feet, those are the only two things that you need. And I was lucky enough to have teachers that allowed me to figure that out. But in terms of reading, I think every American should read The Art of Power by John Meacham. It's a biography of Thomas Jefferson, you know, one of the fathers of this country. And I love this country so much, I couldn't even explain it to you. And Jefferson was, I think, the central figure in the Founding Fathers, you know, for me. Just his character and the way that he dealt with power is amazing. It's, a, it's really, and John Meacham is just such a wonderful writer. He's been on our podcast. We mm -hmm. love him. And do you have a favorite quote? Well, there's a couple of them, actually. I used to play, uh, <laughs> I used to play with an old uh, priest, Father Flanagan. Uh, at Balmoral <laughs> Golf Club in Belfast. And he would say, Davy boy, it's not a sin if you don't enjoy it. Oh. <laughs> but the one that springs to mind for me was, is a Jefferson quote. He said that all we need are teachers and soldiers. Everything in between will take care of itself. If you think about that, it's as true today as it was then. If you've got great teachers, you'll have great children. If you've got great children, you'll have a great country. And mm -hmm. if you've got a great country, you're going to need a great military to look after it because other people will want it. They'll want what you have. Oh, Thank you God. for being Thank you. on our podcast and for sharing and being so open and such oh, a gift to the world. And so really. we thank you.
Thank you. That's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. I would do anything incidentally for any member of the Bush family. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doral. Be well. <laughs>